Um, starting for a little technical difficulties here. It's probably reminiscent of when you started having your little ones. Everything was just smooth sailing, right? So, but uh, thanks for hanging with us on that. We're uh, every now and then we got some kinks to work out and stuff. So, but uh, again, just want to wish you a very happy Mother's Day. We're thrilled that you're here with us and that you're spending your Sunday morning with us. Hope you have a nice day planned ahead of you. You know, hopefully you've got the back rubs coming and the foot rubs and all that kind of stuff. Don't let them off the hook today. It's your day. So. But, uh, well, this, uh, uh, one announcement we forgot to make. Um, today's Bob's birthday. I don't know if uh, any of you knew that or not. But uh, if you're ever watching this at home and you're not here, or you're watching the video podcast, or you're sitting on a chair or anything like that, a lot, a lot of these things Bob does around here, too. So let's sing happy birthday this morning. Oh. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bob, happy birthday to you. It's a great red flush. <laughs> you can blame your wife for that, by the way. I didn't realize today was your birthday. She shot me a note. So. Yeah, well, but, uh, I'll get her. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, if you would open your Bible with me this morning to Luke chapter 1. Uh, we're going to go ahead and make our way through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to begin this morning looking at this uh, wonderful account of the life of Jesus. And uh, I've mentioned uh, in times past that uh, I never like to get too far away from a Gospel, and so uh, as we make our way through the New Testament, we find ourselves this morning coming back to the story of Jesus. And it's a refreshing thing to come back uh, once in a while and read the story, because you know, we, uh, uh, we love to get into, uh, as of course, you know, if we go verse by verse through the Bible now, one of the reasons we love that is because it gives us a chance to kind of dig into some of the theological aspects of our faith and pick them apart and begin to understand them thoroughly and everything. And there's something um, wonderfully, refreshingly uh, approachable about the Gospels. They tell the story, his story. And, uh, and so we're going to go ahead and, and look at one of the four accounts in our New Testaments uh, this morning by looking at the Gospel of Luke. So uh, we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1 just to get started uh, here in these uh, first few moments together. Does anybody need a Bible, by the way? If you do, uh, just raise your hand. We'll get one to you. Make sure you have one that you can read along. I know a lot of people are just packing iPhones and tablets now and stuff. But if you, if you still like the sound of pages turning, let us know. You're all good? All right. Yeah, I like to... Uh, call this the sword and everything, and sometimes the, uh, the little pocket Bibles, we call them the switchblades, you know, and that kind of thing. I guess we're going to have to call the tablets the sword and the phones the switchblades now in our day, but anyway, so Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 1, just the first four verses to get us underway. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled or most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word deliver them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect or accurate understanding of all things from the very first, to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Fathers, we just look at these opening words of the Gospel of Luke. We just pray that, Father, you would help our hearts to be ready to understand more fully those things that we have maybe at one time read or heard about the story of Jesus. And we pray that, Father, you would help us to understand these things that we too might have an accurate knowledge of these things that we have come to believe. Pray that, Father, your Holy Spirit would move among us in our study, helping us to see all the more clearly the face of Christ, who has come to save us and set us free and has promised an eternity to us that is beyond our ability to even comprehend at this point. And so we thank you, Lord, for this account. and pray you'd help us to understand it as we go through it. In Jesus' name, amen. It was John who wrote in chapter 5, verse 39 of his gospel that in, his, in uh, Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees, he said to them, you study the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but it is they that testify of me. Now, obviously, at that point, Jesus was referring to the Old Testament in that time period, the New Testament having not yet been written. But as the New Testament becomes uh, written for us, we become, it becomes very clear that not only the Old, but the Old and the New together entirely point to Jesus. Uh, there is no part of the Bible that in some way does not lead us ultimately to the person of Christ, whether it is to help to see uh, something about his nature, his character, the work that he accomplished, everything about Scripture in one way or another ultimately leads us to the person of Christ. And that's never more clearly true than in the Gospel accounts themselves. 
Uh, there are four accounts in the New Testament. Of course, this will be familiar for you, but it is in these accounts that we really see the telling of the story of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Now, there is clearly, as I mentioned before, throughout the New Testament, a lot of theology, and the Gospels are not devoid of theology. As a matter of fact, they form the fountain of New Testament theology, the foundation, the, uh, the springboard for all that comes after, even in the epistles, as they become the explanation of the Gospel. But it's in these four accounts that we come to see the person of Christ. We come as close as we can, 2,000 years later, to touching him, to knowing him, to hearing his voice. And so we don't approach it lightly, but we approach it differently than we might some of the epistles of Paul or Peter or James or uh, any of the other New Testament writings. Um, there is certainly something to be gained, and we'll, we'll plumb the depths as, mu as much as we can as we go through the Gospel of Luke. But at the same time, we never want to lose sight of the fact that this was written to be a story about the person of Jesus to those who would read it with the intent that they might come to believe in him. Okay, so there's a beautiful simplicity about the attitude and approach in telling the story. Uh, and so as we look at this, we'll of course dig in, but let's not lose the forest for the trees as well as we go through it. Now again, there's four inspired accounts of Jesus' life. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are what are known as the Synoptic Gospels, and they are called that because they are similar in content. Uh, and they also have specific audiences and perspectives from which and to which they write. Uh, in terms of uh, Matthew's Gospel, he writes to the Jews. His is the Gospel of the Kingdom. He presents Jesus as the King, the Messiah, the one who has been promised from Aeon's past and has now come. And so Matthew takes that perspective and he writes to the Jews. Mark, who got most of his testimony from Peter, as it's presumed, uh, writes to the Romans. He writes a very quick-paced, very succinct gospel account. He doesn't spend lots of time in the Old Testament because the Romans wouldn't necessarily be familiar like the Jews would in Matthew's case. And so he writes a very swift, kind of quick-moving gospel that points to who he is. It even starts out with a bang. The, good, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's how Mark starts his gospel. It just gets right to the point. Uh, but he writes to a Roman audience predominantly. Uh, John uh, is not really, uh, it's not clear that John had a specific audience in mind. His is extremely general. But the, the reason for his writing is written at the end of his gospel. These things, among all the things that could be written about Jesus, so many things, in fact, that it would take more space than there are books, uh, than there is to hold all the books that could record it. But this is written that you might believe, that you might know and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and knowing that you might be saved. By his name. And so he makes his, his, his reason for the writing very clear. Luke is writing to the Gentiles. Luke is writing to a non Jewish audience predominantly, and he's writing to the Gentiles, to the broad scope of those outside of Israel who will hear the gospel story and ultimately know not only the story, but know that they too are invited to come and believe in this Son of God, this Savior. As a matter of fact, Luke uses the words Savior and salvation more than all the other gospel writers combined because he's writing to an audience to whom this particular Savior may not be all that familiar. And so it becomes a very strong emphasis for him. But again, Matthew writes about Jesus, the Messiah King. Mark writes about Jesus, the servant. As you read his gospel, this becomes clear. John writes about Jesus as the divine Son of God. Uh, you know, whereas Matthew and Luke have uh, genealogies of Jesus, we often don't realize that so does John. Instead of going back to Abraham in Matthew's case, or even Adam in Luke's case, he goes back to eternity and says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, how the Word became flesh. But Jesus has a genealogy spelled out in John as well, but his stretches back into eternity. Now, some of the characteristics of Luke's Gospel as we move into this. First off, it's the longest of the four Gospels. He's a very detailed account of the life of Christ. Uh, it's the only Gospel written by a Gentile, interestingly, Luke and of course, uh, Luke is volume one. Volume two of Luke's writings is what? Acts. Okay? Luke writes these two stories, or these two accounts, I should say, uh, with a particular reason in mind. Uh, and we'll discuss that uh, as we go through. But he is also a physician. Colossians, Paul writes in chapter four that Luke is the beloved physician. And as such, interestingly, in the Greek, a lot of the words that he uses tend to be common among that profession at that time. So the detail that he writes is not only in, in, in recognizing various aspects, but even the language he uses is somewhat specific. As a matter of fact, his has been called the most beautiful book ever written. He's extremely eloquent in his use of the Greek language. He's a wordsmith. Uh, he's, not, uh, he's not casual about his word choices. And we'll see this as we go through. 
Luke not only focuses on the humanity of Jesus as the Son of Man, but also on Jesus' humanity through his interaction with the sons of men. His is a compassionate kind of gospel. Uh, he relates to people. The way Luke paints Jesus in this gospel account shows him relating to people on a much more human kind of level uh, than the other gospels tend to. And as such, Luke has a heavy emphasis on the poor, on the outcasts, on the, the women who follow Jesus. And he speaks of prayer a lot, praise, and he speaks of Christ's passion in more detail than the other accounts. Um, he's a very in touch with the humanity of Christ, uh, attempt at telling the story of Christ. Similarly to John, Luke also has a heavy emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And it's in Luke and in Acts that we see Jesus telling them to wait in Jerusalem until they are endued with power from on high as the Holy Spirit will come upon the believers in those early days. Luke uses the term Savior again in salvation more than in any of your, the accounts. And, uh, and uh, again, it's to emphasize not only the, uh, he emphasizes not only the humanity of Christ, but also ultimately who he is. He is the Savior. He is the one and only. And like John, he puts a heavy emphasis on who Jesus is in that regard as well. Now, I've mentioned before that volumes one and two of Luke's writing were written with a specific purpose in mind, and it is presumed that the reason for that is because Paul uh, one day was going to stand before Caesar, and it is presumed that Luke was writing his uh, what would ultimately become his court documents. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Luke does, uh, does not include the uh, destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, which was certainly a huge event that probably would have made its way to the book of Acts if it had been written that late. That tells us that the, uh, the book of Acts was written earlier than that, uh, which means the book of the Gospel of Luke was written even earlier than that, generally that's presumed around 58 to 62 AD. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's held that as Luke wrote these accounts, it was for the purpose of having documents to show uh, for Paul's life and as his testimony when he stood before Caesar. So a lot of detail there, and that has something uh, possibly to do with that. Now, as we again read the introduction to Luke's Gospel, his first four verses as Luke begins his, his account of Jesus' life, he starts by saying how many have set out to record Jesus' life or to make a record or an account of the life of Jesus. And that is true. Uh, we lean on the four that we know are inspired accounts, uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they were not the only ones to try and write about the story of Christ, uh, both at that time and certainly even much later. Uh, there are many other gospel accounts that are written, and generally they have been, you know, a lot of those are even extant today in some various amounts of manuscript copies and that. Um, but they are very different than the ones that we understand to be inspired. Uh, many of those other accounts are very fanciful. They, they tell stories of Jesus as a baby, or uh, speaking from uh, the cradle as a baby and this kind of thing, or touching dead birds and bringing them back to life as a child and all these other kinds of things. Um, and so, uh, when, you know, when you read them, you can tell they're different. But Luke does make the point that lots of people have tried to tell that story, but he makes the emphasis that, look, I am trying to write you an orderly account, an orderly account, an account that follows chronologically for the most part, that you can read straight through and get a very full sense of who this person of Jesus is. He says, that which was believed among us. Okay, to set an order and narrative of those things which have been fulfilled, or again, uh, uh, believed among us. Who is us? Christians. Uh, people who at that time were called Christ people, or the way was a term that was used to describe the church in the first century. This is what Luke is saying. I want to make sure that you, O uh, Theophilus, would know what it is that we believe. These things that you have heard about us, I want to make sure you have a good understanding of what these things are. This was important for Luke because, again, as many other accounts or stories or tales of Jesus' life had uh, already even come to light, Luke wants to make sure that Theophilus has a good, solid understanding of what we really believe. Now, even in our day, people have a sense of what Christians are about or what they believe and the kinds of things that that we hold is true. It's important for us to have an understanding of what we believe and why. And of course, as we've gone through the New Testament, we've taken time to discuss those things. But the gospel story is one that we often take very casually as believers because we've heard it so many times, or we think we know certain passages now because it's very familiar. So this will be useful for us to go through and read a gospel and to study it, to kind of shore up once again that understanding of what it is that we believe. But he says, that which was believed among us. Uh, that which we have a fully convinced, uh, assured uh, conviction of is what he is saying there. It's a very direct and strong word. Theophilus, I want you to know those truths 
that we hold as dear, that we are convicted of, and that we are assured of, most surely held, and even had been fulfilled among us. As a matter of fact, Luke himself believed it enough to join Paul's missionary endeavors. Uh, we read throughout the book of Acts from chapter 16 on many times where the story goes from and they did that to and we did this and we went here and there. Luke becomes part of the missions party that Paul is leading. He had some skin in the game, as it were. You know, he's somebody who didn't just simply write an account as an outsider, even though he took his understanding from eyewitness accounts. He did not witness these things firsthand, is what he's saying, but nevertheless, he took on the role of sort of an investigative journalist to get to the heart of what really happened and to give a good, solid, detailed account so that he could then pass it on. But he not only wrote it as an outsider, an objective observer, outside of here with no real connection, no, he actually believed it. When he came to understand and know these things, it went from simply knowledge to faith, from simply knowing facts to personal belief. This was important. And Luke went on the, the missionary journeys with Paul in many cases uh, as, as, as part of his team because he was so convicted of these truths. Now again, as I mentioned, Luke seeks to write a chronological account. I mentioned before I grew up Catholic, and uh, when I first came out of the Catholic Church as a born-again believer, um, uh, a girl I had been dating at the time, her parents were very staunch Catholic, and they were really trying to convince us that we were wrong for not being Catholic anymore and this kind of thing. So they encouraged us to go to this Bible study that they're having at our church, and the guy's teaching it, and when you know it, he was teaching the Gospel of Luke. And the first thing he said about the Gospel of Luke was, now it's important for you to understand that Luke is writing, but he's not really necessarily writing things in order or anything. He's just telling the stories of Jesus. And, 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 and he read through this section and didn't change his thought on that at all. I thought, wait a minute. Luke is saying, no, I'm trying to write an orderly account, something that is put detail by detail by detail so you can get from start to finish and not be jumping all over the place. I want to give you a nice, clear, chronological account of what's going on. So understand as we read through this, not every single instance necessarily follows chronologically, but by and large, it is, a, it is an orderly account. It is intended to take you from beginning to end and help you understand all the paths and, uh, to get there. And so, um, so it's one of the wonderful distinctives of Luke's gospel, but that's what Luke is seeking to do, to give a chronological and, and satisfying full account of the life of Jesus. Now again, his account was compiled from eyewitness testimony. Uh, his account is intended to provide evidence primarily for Theophilus so that he will have a solid understanding of that which Christians believe. That is his first audience, was Theophilus. We don't know a lot about Theophilus, except when, when uh, Luke calls him the most excellent Theophilus. Uh, that term is often used of those who are in leadership or rulers of some kind, or in some degree or another, an important person. It wasn't just you know, my great friend Theophilus. No, most excellent Theophilus. It's a very respectful kind of a title almost in its terminology. So we presume from that that Theophilus is somebody who is important on some level. The, the name Theophilus is taken from two words, Theos and Philos, which speaks of one who is a friend of God. Good name. Don't think about that next time you have a child. Theophilus. It sounds like a funny name, but it's actually a great name. Friend of God or even lover of God. Uh, as that word phileo uh, is, is part of the root of his name. Now, from that point on, as he sets the stage and talks about why he's writing his gospel account, he then moves into the story. But he doesn't start with Jesus. He starts with one who comes before Jesus, starting in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now we see Herod comes into the story. Now Herod, spoken of here, is the same Herod in Matthew chapter 2. This is Herod the Great. Okay, This is Herod the Great, uh, who we know in history uh, for a number of reasons. One, we recognize Herod as one of the great builders and one of those uh, extremely talented uh, uh, builders of the ancient world in that, but his ability and prowess in, in construction and in design and building and in, in, in grandizing structures was only matched by his cruelty, his uh, extreme harshness, his heartlessness. As a matter of fact, his ambitions often drove him to kill even his own children, uh, lest he lose his position and authority. This is not a man who is to be recognized and admired. It's a man who is to be feared a man who is uh, very much a despot in every sense of the word. 
Um, now he's placed by Mark Antony as ruler of that area, and it included Judea, so he figures prominently in the gospel story. But he's not the Herod that follows through the entire story. Eventually Herod does die, and we come encounter with three of his sons who were placed there by Rome after he died to rule over various areas that Herod had ruled over in his life. And we see two of them uh, in, in the gospel accounts. One of them is Antipas, and one of them is Philip. And we know them together because Antipas married Philip's wife and became the, the target of some of John the Baptist's preaching uh, as he condemned him for this act. Uh, but the Herod family was, in simple terms, really messed up, dysfunctional to the max. And this was not a family uh, that you would glean from and seek to, to learn a lot of good things from. You would learn from their mistakes, if anything. But anyway, Herod is now mentioned early in the story, as are Zacharias and Elizabeth. Okay, by contrast to Herod, you have Zacharias and Elizabeth. Now, Zacharias is a priest, according to the family of Levi, by the order of Abijah, uh, which means he is part of a group of priests divided by divisions for the sake of service in the temple work. Uh, it is said during that period of time that about 20,000 priests existed and were in operation functioning during the time of Jesus, which means for any of those uh, priests to be able to serve in the temple, as we'll see that Zacharias did, was quite a gift. Uh, it says he was the lot fell upon him to serve in such and such a way. That was it was like a lottery in a sense. A lot was picked to see which priest would get to do what duty in the temple during a certain period of time during the day or the year or during the feast. Well, Zacharias, as we'll see, is is given an opportunity to go and serve in what would be a very rare treat for any priest and probably the only opportunity he would have in his life to do what he had a chance to do. But Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, also a daughter of Aaron. And again, it says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They were the kind of people you would look up to and admire. And in their old age, they had been walking with God in a way that was noteworthy. They said before God, they walked uprightly. They walked in the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, verse 7, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Now, in that time, uh, there was a very strong stigma about women who could not have children. You don't necessarily see it quite the same way today, although in some quarters we do. But in that time, it, was, it carried a very heavy stigma. Uh, to not be able to have a child implied in the minds of some that somehow God was withholding a blessing from you. There was something there that God was not uh, blessing in your life. And so from Elizabeth's standpoint, we're told right off the bat that that was not the case for her. She walked uprightly with her husband, Zacharias. It was not a matter of God withholding any kind of a blessing if that idea, even as a general rule, was true to begin with, which I don't really subscribe to the idea that it was. But in their belief system, the story here is told, well, look, that's not the case with Elizabeth. But God had just not given her a child. She had been barren to that point. Now she was in old age. Okay, so that's the story that's being set up here. Now, as we continue on in verse 8, So it was, while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense uh, when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you shall have you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice uh, at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn away many of the children of Israel, or turn uh, turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Zacharias is given this opportunity as the lot falls upon him to serve in the temple. The angel shows up while he is serving in that place. and says, your prayer has been answered. What has Zacharias been praying for? Child. Zacharias and, and Elizabeth are well advanced in years. They're old. They're past childbearing. They're, they're, not, they're not in that span of life that you would typically have kids at all. Nevertheless, they continued to pray. They believed. 
they trusted that God might answer that prayer, no matter what their physical condition might have been. They were people who prayed in faith that God would answer that prayer. Now, as Zechariah served in the temple, this would be what we would call the second temple. The first temple being Solomon's, right? Now, of course, Solomon's temple is preceded by the tabernacle that uh, was built under the time of Moses. And when Solomon builds the temple, that becomes the first temple. It's an extremely grand, beautiful, uh, eye-catching uh, structure. It's magnificent. It was uh, when, when you read the description of it and kings and such, and you read about just how beautiful it was, it was quite ornate. It was a, a spectacle. Um, this temple is the second temple. Uh, this is the temple that was built during the time of Haggai. Uh, when uh, the first temple had been destroyed as, after it was sacked, and, 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 and ultimately when Haggai's time comes, and he's a prophet in the Old Testament, and they are building this second temple, but it's not nearly as impressive as the first. And that forms the basis of, of Haggai. It's like there's this weeping uh, on the part of the older people who remember the first temple, and now are extremely underwhelmed by the structure being built that will be the second temple. But the younger people are all excited. They don't remember the first temple. They're just thrilled to death that this temple is being built, and they can worship God. And Haggai speaks to that in his writings in that. Well, this is the temple that, that Zacharias is serving in. Um, interestingly, in Haggai, God makes the promise through the prophet that the glory and splendor of the second temple will be greater than the first. Why? Because the second temple would have the Messiah standing at it. It would, be, it would be existent during the time of the Savior. So anyway, this is the temple we speak about. Now Herod, in all of his prowess building, wanted to sort of uh, grease the skids a little bit with the Jews and wanted to become more popular among them as a leader and wanted to have less and less trouble among them. And so what he did is he took this less impressive structure and aggrandized it so it became a much more uh, large and beautiful structure Hence, trying to endear himself to the people, not because he cared about them, but because he wanted to have a smooth reign without trouble and problems. Uh, it can well be said of Herod that he didn't have love in his heart for anybody but Herod. But he wanted to make his life easier, and so he devoted himself to building this temple so that the people would fall in line for him and actually even uh, just be obedient to him. So, once he's serving in the temple, as he is, as he is offering incense... Uh, incense was offered in the more, before the morning and evening sacrifices. Now, what is incense generally associated with in Scripture? Prayer. That's right. And so what he's doing is he's bringing incense before the Lord. He's not in the Holy of Holies there, but he's serving in this outer area where he is offering up incense. Prayers of the saints uh, are being symbolized in this. And, and Zacharias is, as a priest, one who is bringing the prayers of the people before the Lord as he will then come out and, and hopefully having a word from the Lord to share with the people as he's, met, as he's sought to meet with him. Now, in this temple, has the presence of God been in this temple? No. No. It's been quiet for 400 years. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, well, of course, John actually, we find out, is considered the last of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus says that John, uh, uh, you know, the Old, the Old Testament prophets were up until John. But Malachi is the last of the Old Testament prophets in a strict sense of the term. And it's been over 400 years since God has spoken to his people. The glory of the Lord departed from the temple even earlier than that. In Ezekiel chapter 10, he gives this dramatic uh, testimony of what he saw as the glory of the Lord moved from the holy place and went to the front of the temple and then lifted off in the way and the glory departed. It was a tragic day in Israel's history and since that time God has not inhabited this temple. And so there is this desire to meet with God but he's not there like he was in the first temple. It's different now. The priests are serving and doing their work and everything but it's not like it was before. They still had the fear and reverence and respect to not just walk into the Holy of Holies. That was still considered a sacred place. Nevertheless, it was different than it was before. But this is the temple, again, that Zechariah is serving in. He's offering up these, uh, to these, with these bowls of incense and offering incense to the Lord and everything. An angel shows up. Now, Zechariah was terrified, in part because an angel showed up, but in part because this is the first divine connection of some kind in the temple in a really long time. A really long time. And so the angel Gabriel shows up. Now this is not the first time Gabriel has appeared on the scene, is it? He appears in Daniel, and he'll appear again uh, in, in uh, just a few, you know, just down the road appearing to Mary as well. But Gabriel is an angel who hundreds and hundreds of years ago appeared to Daniel 
and shared this vision of the 70 weeks and how the kingdom of God that is coming one day to crush the kingdoms of men and all of this story in, in, uh, that, that, that Daniel shares about. Um, so Gabriel is then speaking uh, on behalf of the Lord to Daniel. Well, now Gabriel shows up again to Zacharias. Imagine Zacharias' shock when he introduces himself. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. Gabriel, I read about you and Daniel. Imagine. What if Gabriel showed up right here? Think of what you would feel like, what that would be like for you. It's amazing to think. Well, this is who shows up and begins to speak to Zechariah. Zechariah, it says, he's afraid. Fear came upon him, and he was troubled. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. Think of the comfort of that. I mean, in the midst of this, don't be afraid, Zechariah. I've come with good news from the Lord. He's heard your prayer. He's been listening to you, and he's heard. Now, Zacharias's prayer, again, has been for a child. You know, he and Elizabeth have been praying, and God has now come and said, I've heard you. Think of the faith of Zacharias and Elizabeth. We hear they are old in, in years, but they're, they're having a child at this age is not unprecedented. Uh, no doubt, as, as they walked with the Lord, they thought oftentimes about Abraham and Sarah and how God, even in their old age, could deliver this wonderful child. And Isaac, this child laughter, uh, would just fill their home because of the birth of this son. No doubt they were hanging on the same thing, saying nothing is too hard for our God. Look what he did with them. He could bring us a child, even in our own age. And, and imagine that Zechariah's thinking, you were listening, God. Fear turns into joy, maybe even weeping there in that holy place as he began to think about the fact that the God of Israel had heard him. This seemingly insignificant person that we read about nowhere else. But God says, I've heard you. I've listened. And you will have a son. As a matter of fact, your boy is going to be special. Your boy has a mission. Your boy has been chosen by God to do something that will set him apart from even all of the other prophets that have ever come before him. And so, again, you'll have joy and uh, great gladness of many people rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He'll also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. You'll be great. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now think about that. This is God speaking, telling Gabriel to come and tell Zacharias about the son that they're going to have. You're not just going to have a son. It's not just going to be that your prayers will be answered. It's not just the, the simple truth that you are going to experience the joy of, of fatherhood now in your old age. But this child is going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Now, how would, which one of us would not have loved to have had a message from God about our child at that stage? When Julie and I adopted our daughter from Russia, it would have been incredible. You know, one of the rooms we stayed in had this little box on the wall that seemed to constantly be talking. We called it WKGB. And it was this little box here that just, it was just constant little Russian coming out of it. I have no idea at that time what they said. My Russian was not nearly good enough to follow that. But imagine if in that room, as we were sitting there, just kind of going through the process, waiting to go pick up our child and everything, as we're hearing this, imagine if all of a sudden it switched from Russian to, Brian, Juliet, the Lord has heard your cries. And this child is going to be yours, and she is going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Imagine yourself in the position that you were in when your first child was coming, getting a message like that from God. Oh, the joy that would fill your heart. Not just that you're going to have a child, but this child is going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Amazing. They've been praying for a child. And Elizabeth, no doubt, have been praying that just that her barrenness, this reproach upon her, would be lifted and she'd be... Uh, you know, just free of that kind of stigma in society. Zacharias, no doubt, had been hoping for a son who would continue in his priestly footsteps as he went through, because he had no heir. But he was praying, no doubt, that he would have one. And God hears this prayer and gives them a son whose name means Jehovah is a gracious giver. John, Yonan. John is born into a priestly family, and he has a priestly bloodline. Now, even though he would never officially serve in the priesthood, in his ministry, John the Baptist would fulfill that essential ministry of a priest to prepare the hearts of people to meet with their God. Zacharias, your son is going to do this. I didn't tell Zacharias that he wasn't going to literally work in the priesthood and that kind of thing, but nevertheless, that which every priest endeavors to do, his son was going to do, and he was going to be seen as great in the eyes of the Lord for having done it. 
So God answers Zacharias and Elizabeth's prayer. But he also was beginning to unfold his answer to the prayers of his chosen people. Remember, it says here that not only was Zacharias offering prayers to the Lord, and among the prayers he offered was his own prayer for a son, uh, but also the people outside were gathered for prayer. They were also praying along with Zechariah. Zacharias. They were hoping uh, that God would speak to them as well. And among the many things that they would have been praying for that day, no doubt at all, they would have been praying two specific things. One, as always, they would be praying for forgiveness, as they would commonly do in the temple. Little did they know that the one who was going to come and be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world, they were on the cusp of seeing him. And secondly, not only were they praying for forgiveness, but I also believe they were praying for deliverance. This was a common prayer of the Jews. Save now. When Jesus came and rode into town later on in that donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9 9, they were crying out, Hosanna, save now, son of David. They were so primed and ready to be delivered from the Roman oppression that they were under. They were under no less oppression now. As a matter of fact, Herod, after hearing about the birth of Christ, this king who would dare to be born in his reign and potentially threaten to take over the kingdom, Herod would set out to destroy all of the firstborn, all the children that were born, the male children, two years and under. He would seek to destroy them. He'd be extending his authority and demonstrating to this insignificant group of people in Judea and Samaria and this, this, this part of the Middle East, he would be demonstrating to them that they are nothing and he has the power even to take their lives at will if he wants to. They were oppressed. When the Pharisees told Jesus, we have never been under the yoke of anyone, that was the most ridiculous comeback they could possibly have had. They've spent a huge part of their history under oppression. And they were under oppression then when they said that to Jesus. They were ready to be delivered. They were desiring to be free. They were looking for Messiah to come and rule and reign from Jerusalem with a rod of iron and set up his kingdom and, and rule from Jerusalem over the whole world. And they, as his chosen people, would rule and reign with him. That is the mindset and the, and the vibe that is in, in Israel. As a matter of fact, when Jesus is born, we'll read about that not this time, but, but in the coming studies. We'll come to the birth of Christ, obviously. But it's interesting, because in Genesis 49, there's a prophecy that the scepter would not depart from Judah. And during this period of time, when Israel had lost its right to capital punishment, being under the Roman yoke, there were those among the, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they wept, because the word of God in their minds had been broken promise of God had not come to pass because they were now without one sitting on the throne of David. Little did they know that just up the road a king had been born. God's promise was not unfulfilled. But this was the mindset. We wanted to be delivered and now we've been let down. We're looking for Messiah. What is God going to do? Is God going to do something? This was what was going on at that time. And so no doubt the people praying there around Zacharias at the temple were praying for deliverance as well. God will one day set up his promised kingdom. As a matter of fact, the king who will rule and reign over it was going to be born very shortly from this time. But first, he was going to come and deliver them from a far greater enemy than Rome. He was going to save them from sin and death. And so they gathered around and they prayed. And Zechariah meets with the angel who promises and the son who's going to come is one who will be great in the sight of the Lord. Why was he going to be great? He says so right here. He explains why. He will be great in the sight of the Lord, verse 15. First off, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He's going to live a life that is different than what is common in that time. Uh, as a matter of fact, this passage harkens back to number 6, where it speaks of what is called a Nazarite vow. Uh, starting in verse 3 of chapter 6, we begin to see an unfolding of what this is. And there's a lot involved in it, involved, including things like not... A razor won't touch your head and all this kind of a thing. You won't, you won't touch wine or strong drink as it is said up here. And so it's presumed that John the Baptist will live under this Nazarite vow. He's going to be one who's going to be consecrated to God is ultimately what is in, in play here and in view here. He is one who will be set apart for the Lord. He'll drink either wine or strong drink. Secondly, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. We'll see that to be true as Mary, when she comes pregnant in the sixth month, it comes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. This baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps at, at just the fact that you know Mary has showed up with, with the Messiah within her. He's filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, but he will have a life upon which the Holy Spirit will have tremendous power as he serves in his ministry before the Lord and before the coming King. He will also turn away many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. 
That will be his call to prepare. In fact, what is John's call? Preparing the way of the Lord. He becomes this forerunner who is, uh, sharing, who is sharing with the people the importance to prepare the way for the king that they have been waiting for. Uh, in that time, when a king would come to town, uh, that village, if they knew the king was coming, what they would do is they would create, if one did not already exist, they would either clear away or create a road that would go straight through that town that was without hindrance, without obstacle, no potholes. I'm from Chicago, I'll tell you something about potholes. But they would make sure the road was smooth and straight. There would be no bumping of the cart that the king was on. It would be, the king is coming, make straight his paths, clear everything out of the way that would obstruct him from coming to and through our town. So when John begins to declare that it's time to prepare the way of the Lord, he is speaking about them making a path to their hearts that is unobstructed. So when the king comes, they are ready for him. They are ready to receive him. That is his ministry. He will turn the hearts of many in Israel toward the Lord their God. And we'll see when we look at the ministry of John that clearly that begins to take place in his time. And he goes on and says, He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he'll come in the spirit and power of Elijah. As a matter of fact, tradition holds uh, that when John is baptizing down at the Jordan, one of the reasons people came was because of the call to repentance. You know, the idea that, you know, this, this you know, they're wondering, are you even the Messiah? And he would declare he wasn't, but the one who's coming after him, the Messiah who is coming, and he is coming after me, I'm not worthy of him. But people would come because they were convicted by God to come and repent and to be baptized and declare that they want to walk with God in purity. Not only that, but tradition holds that, uh, that John the Baptist actually wore the belt of Elijah as part of his clothing. And so, now think about it. Now, John is baptizing between 15 and 20 miles outside of the main population, and people are coming in droves to be baptized by him. Partly it's conviction, partly it might have been, well, let's check this out. He's, he's got Elijah's belt for crying out loud. This is amazing. It's like a sightseeing thing for some people. Um, but, you know, uh, in any case, uh, he will come, in the, not just in the wardrobe of John, <laughs> of Elijah, but he will come in the power and the spirit of Elijah, and he'll have the, the mission of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make a people ready, prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias, verse 18, said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach from among people. So Zacharias can't believe his ears. You know, he's like, how do I know this is really going to happen? Now, well, that's kind of mean that Gabriel makes him mute. He can't speak now for the next nine months until John comes born. That's kind of rough. Well, I don't know if Zacharias necessarily thought it was rough or not. You know, his silence became a testimony in itself to the fact that he met with the Lord. The people recognized something had happened when he came out. He was in there for a while, and, and he comes out. He's probably trying to speak to him about what happened, but he can't. Uh, interesting way the Lord works in that. You know, you'd think he'd want John telling everybody what just happened, but he can't speak it to people. I don't know if he wrote it or what later, but... Um, but Zacharias can't believe his ears. And so the angel shuts his mouth. And uh, it's just an interesting thing here. But, you know, oftentimes when, when God is going to do something that is beyond our ability to really, you know, it's, it's beyond us. We, we often think a miracle is something, something that we, to some degree or another, might have been able to do ourselves. God is good. He allowed this to happen as I did it. And that's, that's the extent of what we think a miracle is. But when God does something genuinely miraculous, something that is so far removed from anything we could do, where it is so clearly Him, a work that is... I mean, they've been praying for this, remember. They've been praying for a child, and God says, you can have one. I don't believe it. It's, you remember in the book of Acts when Peter's in jail, and they're having a prayer meeting at at, uh, at, uh, at this home, and this the angel comes and lets Peter out. Now, 
In that story, by the way, quick aside, as, as the angel shows up, Peter is sleeping in his cell. He's going to be put to death the next day, as far as he knows. He's asleep, sound asleep. Look, whether I die and go be with the Lord, fine. But, you know, Peter possibly didn't believe he was going to die the next day because Jesus had told him that when you are old, they will carry you away against your will. Peter was not an old man yet, so he may have been sleeping in faith, knowing that somehow God's going to get him out of this. So the angel, he's sleeping soundly. So the angel comes and, and kicks him and wakes him up. And Peter kind of wakes up, sees what's going on. He thinks he's seeing a vision. The angel takes him by the hand. He just kind of waves the doors open and, and leads Peter out to the street and then disappears. And there's Peter standing on the street. The guards were not asleep because that was a penalty punishable by death. They were wide awake when this happened and they didn't see a thing. So God delivers Peter out of this thing. Peter realizes in the middle of the street, all of a sudden he's out of jail. What do I do now? So he runs off to this house where he knows believers are gathered in prayer, and he's knocking on the door. And they're praying, nothing happens. So finally a servant girl named Rhoda, named Rhoda comes up. She opens the door, sees Peter, and says, I don't believe it. She runs back, leaves him at the door. He's still outside. Broad daylight. He's a convict. He's out, he's out of jail, and he's standing outside at somebody's door. She runs back, tells the prayer meeting, who is praying for his release, that Peter's at the door, and they don't believe it. What are you praying for? Why are you praying? You know, it's, it's, that's how we pray, isn't it? Oh, God, I know that somebody's sick. Oh, God, I know that you, you, you could heal, I think. God, I, I know you can do great things. We believe you. We know you can do stuff. We don't really believe him. We don't really think he's going to do something amazing. We don't really think he's going to heal the person who's on their deathbed. We don't really think he's going to uh, restore uh, someone's mental capacities when they're mental capacities are destroyed. We don't believe that you know someone's going to come through and deliver somebody out of this pit that they're in. We pray and we think because it's just what we do as Christians. But do you know that sometimes God's really going to do something ridiculous, ridiculous, something completely out of the box that is beyond us? Uh, he will. He often does. And we want to believe that and know that. The prayer of faith is, is not a prayer of caveats. You know, yes, Lord, we know that sometimes you are glorified in sickness and in illness and even in death. But we also know you told us to pray and to lay hands on, to anoint with oil. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick. You said that, Lord. Sometimes he will do that. And so anyway, Zacharias, who's been, they've been praying probably all of their married life for this moment. They're being old in years. And now finally, God actually lets them know that I've been listening to you. But you know what? I couldn't answer your prayer before because I needed to answer it now. And now that they find out what's coming, I bet they wouldn't have changed a thing. Because their son is not just going to be another kid on the block that they're just happy to have. Their son is the forerunner of Messiah. He's going to help people pave the way so that when Jesus comes, they will receive him and be saved. What a ministry. What an answer to prayer. Talk about doing above and beyond all that we could ask or think. There it is, right there. So Zacharias doesn't believe it, though. He's, he's shocked. He's stunned. He can't believe this is actually happening to him. And so the angel says, well, fine. It's a constant reminder until the kid's born. You can't say anything. Uh, and so, uh, but he says, you know, I'm, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to you to speak these things. You know, how can you not? I'm, here, I'm, I'm a miracle standing in front of you right now, telling you about a miracle that's coming. Believe it. But behold, you'll be mute, not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be filled and fulfilled in their own time. And again, as the people waited, and they were uh, just just wondering what was going on. It wasn't typical for a priest to spend so long doing their duty there. They figured something must be going on in there, and sure enough, something amazing was happening. And only to a, if, if to any degree at all, only to a very limited degree, was he able to even share what was coming. Uh, but one day, very soon, nine months, as a matter of fact, down the road, John the Baptist would come to be. And of course, Elizabeth, again, in verse 24, excited beyond words that she was able to conceive. And she said, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among people. And we'll stop there for today and pick it up in verse 26 next time. But we'll once again see Gabriel in action, this time coming to another uh, woman who is much younger and uh, we'll read about that next time. But, um, you know, as we come to the gospel story, again, there's this wonderful, breathtaking simplicity in, in, in looking at the gospel account and recognizing this is Jesus we're going to be reading about. This is our Savior. This is the one that we one day are going to get to see face to face. We're going to go to heaven and stand before him and see him, the one we're reading about. 
We're so blessed to have these accounts, to be able to look at his life and his ministry and understand what he did and to know about him, to come to him. And even as Jesus said to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To come to know God in a way through his Son that is meaningful and rich and deep, it provokes us. The things that we'll read as we go through the story of Christ will provoke us to walk with him. We'll understand the invitation to come and follow him to count the cost and then to leave behind that which he has called us to leave behind, that we might follow him in freedom without encumbrance, to experience to some degree, even though it's just in word for us here today, as we hopefully can take in that which is given to us, we to some degree will begin to understand some of the wisdom that he shared with his followers, that they too could learn what it means to walk with God, to maybe experience a little bit about his suffering on our sake, and to recognize the importance of that, that act of complete and utter selflessness on behalf of those who are selfish to the nth degree. This is a story worth reading and diving into. Now, if you've if this is all kind of new for you, and again, I, as I said, I always look around the room and I see people that know the Lord, but you know what? I'd just like to just give an opportunity for any who have never given their hearts to Christ to come even today. If you're within the sound of my voice, this is a call to you. It's important that we don't just simply know about Jesus. None of those who followed him closely, like the disciples, simply knew about him. They knew him. They came to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that by believing in him, having faith in his name, we might be saved. And that's the call. If you've never made your commitment to Christ, you've never given your heart to him, you've never surrendered and said, I too believe that you died for my sins, that you are the Savior of the world, the Son of God. And now is the time to make that decision and that commitment to surrender your life and come follow him. Even now, just moments away from sharing in the Lord's Supper, I just want to give that invitation. Let's close our study part of our service by just praying, and I just want to give opportunity for any who might want to pray right now to receive Christ. And then we'll move into a time of sharing the Lord's Supper. Father, I just want to thank you for this time, just opening your word. And uh, here, especially in this place, as we begin to look at the story of Christ, the one who came in the flesh, the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, tabernacling among us, the very presence of God walking among men. Father, we thank you that he came into the world to save sinners. And there's probably a bunch of us in this room that might arm wrestle with Paul a little bit about who, which one of us is the greatest of sinners. But we thank you that your grace is far beyond the depth of our sin. It covers, it pays for, it saves. I thank you, Lord, that as we gather here in this place today and hear of these things, we have opportunity to come walk with you closer than we ever have before. But for those who have never made a commitment to walk with you in the first place, I just want to take this moment to give opportunity for that. If you're in this place, or you're within the sound of my voice, or you're watching later, whatever the case might be, and you've never come to Christ, then I would invite you to share, and repeat after me a very simple prayer. The words are not special. They're only meaningful because they give you an opportunity to do business with God, to come before Him asking for forgiveness and for the strength and the power to walk with Jesus for the rest of your days, leaving behind the old life and being born in Him. So just repeat after me if you're ready to come to Jesus to confess your sin and be forgiven. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I have gone my own way and I've offended you in doing so. But I thank you that you love me in spite of my sin so much that you sent your Son, your only begotten Son, that if I might believe in him, that I might have everlasting life. I do believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sins and to give me a new life. So help me, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit to leave my old life behind and to walk in the newness of life that you have promised. I want to celebrate when I see you face to face. I don't want to fear. I don't want to cower away. I want to rejoice. And I want to hear you say, well done. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for loving me. 
in Jesus' name. And Father, as we prepare our hearts to meet at this table, to share of the bread and the cup, I pray, the Lord, we would take a little time as we move into this time to thank you for forgiving us of our sins, for washing us clean. It was at this table that Jesus shared with his followers that important truth that they were, this was all about deliverance from sin. Thank you for doing that for us, and I pray that our hearts would be ready and prepared as we gather at this place now. Thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I know we're a little short today. I don't know if we have ushers planned. Do we have ushers prepared? Do we have a couple guys? Okay. I want you guys to stay in your seats, and uh, those who are standing up are going to bring communion to you row by row. Have the worship team come on up and share a song with us as we come to this time. As I mentioned, we share the Lord's Supper. We do this once a month. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't do it more or less. And we just do it once a month so it doesn't become simply routine. Uh, but it becomes something special. We think about it as something to look forward to and not something that just becomes a, a part of rote in the service. And so um, that being said, take this time in this moment to appreciate and recognize the beauty of the salvation that God has brought you through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and the cross. Uh, this cross is very pretty. It's very nice. It's a nicely cut piece of wood with a nice clean uh, sheet draped over it and everything. The cross that Jesus bore before he was even nailed to it was hideous looking. It was covered in blood because he had been beaten so horribly. When they scourged him and they brought him to the place where he was going to be ultimately punished for sins that, and for crimes that he never committed, he was scourged. He was scourged because that's what Romans did to try and beat a confession out of somebody. But when Jesus had nothing to confess, they continued to beat him over and over and over again mercilessly. And when finally he was beaten within an inch of his life, he then had to carry the cross up to Golgotha. And while God gave him Simon to help him out, at the same time he carried that, bore that cross until he was unable to move any further. And then he was nailed to it. And he died a horrible, excruciating death. Why do I bring that up? To make you feel guilty so that you'll come to Jesus and all this kind of thing feel bad about your sin? Well, yeah. Yeah. We should feel shame. We should feel horrible about our sin. We shouldn't take lightly what was done on behalf of us by Jesus who didn't deserve any of it. We deserved it all, but he took it all on himself. So take this moment and allow it to be filled with gratitude. Confess to him, share those things that are on your heart that you know need to be handed over to him or confess some sin you may have been walking in. Give it to him. There's forgiveness and there's cleansing at the cross. For all believers, this isn't just for new believers, but for all believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not within us. Trust me, this is the moment to come clean before God. He will forgive you and give you a fresh start. If your fellowship with him has been broken by any sin at all, restore it now. Don't let this moment pass. Let it be all that it should be. The worship team is going to share a song, and when they finish, we'll come back together and take the bread and the cup together.
sharing with them, and telling them that this was his body, which was broken for them. As often as they ate of it, they should do so in remembrance of him, not simply of deliverance from Egypt, as they had some become so accustomed to, in remembrance of him, the deliverer that Moses symbolized, the one who had come to bring the truest kind of deliverance. And so let's take the bread together as we remember him. In the same way, he took the cup. And he shared it with them. And he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant, shed for the remission of sin. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Now, he also commented that he wouldn't drink of this fruit of the vine again until he met them in the kingdom. So it wasn't simply a matter of looking back on the rituals that they had practiced all their lives. It wasn't even limited to the moment that he was sharing with them, but even gave, gave them something to look ahead to. So we drink this cup with tremendous thanks for all that he's done and all that he has yet ahead of us. Let's take the cup. I want you to take the cup in your hand and make sure it's empty because some of you are wearing nice clothes. Go to your brunches and your luncheons and everything. Through Jesus' blood, sin has been crushed. We're free. He's also called us to go out and tell the story. He uses broken vessels to go out and tell the greatest story of all. People are saved by hearing this good news that is delivered in earthen vessels, if you will. Broken vessels. So with that, Lord, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you. Use us, if you will. Why don't you stand as we close in prayer, as we ask the Lord to send us forth with the good news. Don't worry, we'll clean it up.
Father, thank you for the good news. Thank you, Lord, that we've been saved from our sins and we're free. Free to leave this place with an understanding that you love us, you have your hand upon us, that we too, like so many before, can be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit to go out and accomplish much of that same ministry that John had. That you have called us to come and to share this good news, that people's hearts might be prepared to meet with the Lord. So I pray that, Father, even here in these early beginnings as we go through the Gospel of Luke, we would be primed and ready to take this good news out to the streets. Thank you, Father. We thank you that you use broken vessels like us, that you would stoop to take us up and allow us to be trophies of your grace for a broken world to see. God, we just pray that you'd use us. Thank you, Father. Go before us today. I pray that you'd have a special blessing today upon all of the moms, that, Lord, you would... Have your hand upon them. Help them to know how much we appreciate and love them, Lord, and what a gift from you they are to us. We just pray that, Father, you bless their day. God, we bless you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close with a song, and you're free to go.